There's a story in the Bible that you will find repeated over and over. God takes sinners, compromisers, and failures, and he loves them, and he rescues them. And then bit by bit, he changes them, and then he uses them for his glory. That's the story of Abraham. He lied to protect his wife. It's the story of Moses. He murdered an Egyptian. It's the story of David. He slept with another man's wife. It's the story of Peter. He denied Jesus three times. It's the story of Paul. He persecuted the church. And it's our story. For the next several weeks, we are going to look at the story of Esther. And today, you are going to see that she is not as good of a hero in her own story as we always thought. But then, who of us are? In truth, all the heroes of the Bible compromised in one way or the other. So the book of Esther comes to us regardless of how we have compromised in the past. There is hope for us. So how did Esther compromise her faith? Let me paint a picture. King Xerxes is planning to go off to war against the Greeks. The movie 300 takes place between Esther chapter 1 and Esther chapter 2. But before he goes off to war, the king parades his vast wealth down the streets for everyone to see, and he throws a big, huge party with food and drink, and he invites the entire city. On day 187 of the party, he calls for his wife, Vashti, and she doesn't come. To his shock, she denies his request, and so he calls his advisors and says, what should I do? And his advisors advise him to banish her from his presence. The king goes off to war, and he returns two years later. Esther chapter 2 says, After these things, when the anger of the king had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So just by a little time out there in that passage, it says the king's name was Ahasuerus. This is the Hebrew nickname that is given the character in the story, but his Persian name is Xerxes, and it's way easier for me to pronounce. <laughs> so we're gonna go with Xerxes. So Xerxes comes back from war, and he remembers, oh yes, I banished my wife. And he has come back from the war, he has lost, and now there is nobody to console him. It says, then the king's young men who had attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given to them and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king and he did so. So, his advisors say, here's what you got to do. You got to get a harem of virgins. We'll clean them all up. We'll put them through a beauty regiment. And then you take each one out on a one-on-one -on -one date. And then you choose which one you want to be the queen. And Xerxes says, that's a great idea. It's good to be the king. Verse 5 says, Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, son of Shemai, son of Kish, a Benjamite. Notice what you learn about this character before you ever learn his name. You learn that he is a Jew. So this is a family that was taken off into exile when Nebuchadnezzar came and took the Hebrews captive. And 40 years before this story, King Cyrus, who was a different king, had allowed all the Jews to return to their homeland so they could build the wall. And so the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are simultaneously taking place during this story. But some Jews stayed behind. They stayed in the land where they had established a home, and this is where we find Mordecai. Of course, being a practicing Jew, living in Persia, that has its own complications, namely how 
Will we keep our faith in God while trying to be successful in a culture that doesn't share our beliefs? This is what Esther is all about. How does someone maintain their faith in a culture that doesn't worship God? It says he was bringing up Hadessa, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So a couple things you learn about Esther. And the first thing you learn is her name is not Esther. Her name is Hadessa. Hadessa in Hebrew means myrtle tree. The second thing we learn is that she is beyond beautiful. The author makes a point of telling us how beautiful she is because of what is going to happen next. Verse 8 says, So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. Now, notice there we have a passive verb, the word taken, right? Esther is taken. Now, that means one minute she's a young Jewish woman named Hadessa. She's growing up in a Jewish home, and the next minute she is ripped away by a pagan empire, and she is given the name Esther. Esther is a Persian name that means star. Tell me something, from just what you've read so far, what other Bible story does this remind you of? We have a Jew who's ripped from their home, taken to the palace, and given a new name. That'll be the story of Daniel. Daniel says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Ju Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Then the king commanded his chief eunuch to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. Four youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. It's, it's a mirror, right? It's a mirrored story, even down to the fact that the ones that are taken are of good appearance, right? Daniel and his friends are good looking, and the only difference so far is that Daniel is a man and Esther is a woman. That and they were taken for much different reasons. Back to Esther. Verse 9 says, And the young woman, Esther, pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. So again, we see two things. First, Esther adopts the palace lifestyle without hesitation. And she hides the fact that she's a Hebrew. What happens in the Daniel story? Well, in Daniel verse 8, it says, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with king's food or with the wine that he drank, Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. So here is where our two stories take two different roads. This is where they diverge. Daniel does not compromise. He does not hide his beliefs. And he says, I can't eat this food. It's against my religion. And then what happens in verse 10? The chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned you food and drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition that the youths who are of your own age. So you would endanger my head with the king. The king's steward basically says, are you crazy? If anyone finds out about this, we would be killed. Why are you gonna risk our lives over food? And yet, if you list out the heroes of the Bible, Daniel and Esther would both be on this list. But in this moment, just in this moment right here, Esther compromises, doesn't she? She hides her faith and she gives in to palace life. But let's make something clear. 
She doesn't deny her faith. She just conceals it. Her handler advised it. Why? Because as a Hebrew, she is not supposed to be there. I mean, let's be real. This is a Persian king. And his first pick for a bride isn't going to be some Hebrew girl. She is from a broken home. She's poor. She's a member of a slave race. She has been taken only because of her great beauty. And she is basically advised, if you tell anybody that you're a Hebrew, we're dead. And then verse 11 says, Every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. So he knows the truth and he's worried for her. He checks up on her every single day. All right, so now our author is going to give us some of the rules of this beauty contest. What's, what's going to happen? Verse 12 says, Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into the king after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shagazes, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. So each girl gets one night with the king. She has one chance to impress him. She's allowed to bring anything with her. And then afterwards, she's not allowed to see the king again unless he calls her. And the first person we meet in this whole Esther story is the king. And what does it seem like this king is obsessed with? Image, right? Before he goes to battle, he parades all the beauty of his kingdom before all the people. Throws this magnificent party, and he wants everyone to see how beautiful his treasure is, how beautiful his castle is. And then the king says, oh my goodness, I have one more beautiful thing to show you, my wife. Right? What about now? What about today? Do you think we live in a culture that is obsessed with beauty? How often on world or local news do they begin with the phrase, in entertainment news, why do I care what's going on in the lives of beautiful people? Because our culture is obsessed with physical appearance, with internet and television and social media. Never before have we been so barraged with images of beautiful homes, vast wealth, boats, cars, vacations, and beautiful people. In a recent study, nearly two-thirds of parents said their child is self-conscious about some aspect of their appearance. Skin concerns like acne, their weight, their hair, those are some of the top things that the parents reported. Self-consciousness about appearance was obviously more common among teens. 73% of teen girls. 69% of teen boys. And of younger elementary school students, 57% of girls, 49% of boys also said that they were self-conscious about their appearance. And it's not just our nation's children, it's all of us. In a book titled, Beauty is the Beast, the author says the psychological effects of the pursuit of the perfect female body includes unhappiness, confusion, misery, and insecurity. Women often believe that if they only had perfect looks, their lives would be perfectly happy, and they blame their unhappiness on their bodies. And it's not just women anymore, is it? Men are just as hyper-aware that they are not all six feet tall, have chiseled chins, and have big muscles. But is it really true that in order to be somebody, we just need to live up to our culture's definition of beauty? 
Are we really supposed to judge somebody by their physical appearance? In the story of Esther, the king already had a beautiful wife. And she was so beautiful that he wanted to parade her in front of everyone. But when he loses her, his only idea is to replace her with another beautiful woman. The beauty contest for Esther and the other virgins, it was just external. Apparently, the only criteria criteria for King Xerxes is that his wife be the most beautiful. It's very telling for what happens when a culture places so much emphasis on beauty. First, people become replaceable. How sad that King Xerxes can so easily dismiss his wife and replace her. Second, the king doesn't try to find the one, doesn't he? He doesn't invest time into a relationship. He's not trying to find a soulmate. Instead, he's kind of like a kid at an ice cream shop. He has to sample all of life, try everything. For him, there's no commitment in a relationship because he knows maybe something better will come along. Third, all of these women were taken as the most beautiful in all the land. And they had to go through a year of treatment before they were even presented. Which means what? It means you're good, but you're just not good enough. You're beautiful, but you're not beautiful enough. And in the end, one woman will be chosen above all the rest, and then the rest of you will be left in a harem, not able to return to their homes, not able to find their own husbands, for the rest of them they would live in isolation with no children and no husband, just their own wing of the palace with 99 other women who also were not good enough. This is the life of empire. Do everything you can to be beautiful and maybe, maybe the king will remember you. Even if Esther wins just down the hall, are the most beautiful women in the world. And one slip up and you could be just as easily replaced as the queen before you. Verse 15 says, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her, And when Esther was taken to King Ashaharis into the royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of its region, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Esther wins, right? Esther wins. Esther wins. Bible says she finds favor with the king, and she did it without God's help. Right? It's true. But then, she didn't really ask for God's help, did she? In the Daniel story, Daniel and his friends are unwilling to compromise, and they offer a deal. They say, test us. Give us the food that we're asking for, and then compare us and see if we're any different than our counterparts. Verse 17 says, ask for these four youths. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God shows up in the Daniel story. But in the Esther story, God doesn't show up. And everything still works out for her. Why? Well, think about it. Esther and Mordecai had a plan, but their plan didn't include God. Isaiah 40 says, Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine, and who make an alliance but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Now I know, this isn't the story of Esther that you were taught as a kid, and you feel uncomfortable right now. Maybe you're even a little offended that we would question the character of a woman who has a book of the Bible named after her. But I want you to consider the alternative. There was none. The truth is, Esther is in a horrible 
situation. What should Esther have done? Done what Daniel said? Said, I'm not going to eat your food, and here's a list of all the food I'm allowed to eat. When it was her night to be with the king, should she have just said, surprise, I'm a Hebrew, and I, I hope it all works out for you, but, you know, I'm kind of saving myself for a Jewish husband that my parents arranged for me. I can't, I can't marry an uncircumcised Gentile, especially somebody who doesn't worship Yahweh. Don't you see? Esther can't do that. Do you see the dilemma that she is in? There is no convenient way for her to avoid compromise. The choice of going home and being Hadessa again, that is forever off the table. She either puts God first and faces suffering or death, and she goes on to, or she goes on to conceal her faith and she tries to make the best of a horrible situation. And you could say, but what about Daniel? Daniel had the same choice. That is true. But did you ever ask yourself what would happen if a foreign superpower invaded and took over your country? If you were taken, like Daniel or Esther, and the gun was to your head, and you were given the choice, renounce your faith and live, or confess your faith and perish? I think about missionaries in other countries who for them, that is not a hypothetical question. That is a real everyday fact of their life. And in other parts of the world, there are people who, yes, are as brave as Daniel, but they're not always rewarded like he was. For them, it means the end of their life. I think about that compromise, you know? My life has never been threatened. And yet, how often do I compromise my faith so that I don't even experience the slightest bit of suffering? I am in no position to judge Esther or the choices that she makes. How often do I make my own plans to succeed, to live, and I don't include God in those plans? So why should he show up? I didn't include God in my plans. I wasn't relying on him to show up. How many of us live with such total dependence on God that if he were to not keep his promises, we would fail? Instead, how many of us are more like Esther? We can seal our faith to avoid being uncomfortable. How many of us have bought into the values of this world and allowed ourselves to get caught up and carried away by instead of putting God first? The world that's presented in the book of Esther is an absolute mess. But how much different is our world? A world of unrealistic expectations of beauty, and that no matter how hard you try, you're never enough? That even if you succeeded yesterday, today it starts all over again? The good news of this book is, and we'll discover this as we head towards Easter, is we have a hero that is greater than Esther, and we have a king that is greater than Xerxes. We have a better hero than Esther. What does that mean? It means I can't pick on Esther for compromising. All the heroes of the Bible compromise their faith in one way or the other. Of course they do. They were all human. The only one in the Bible who lived a perfect life was Jesus. It's okay to look at where Esther falls because she is not the one I should follow. Esther is not the example for us, at least not in this chapter. But the lesson we can learn, or the points we could think about, is maybe we should stop concealing our faith. Just because we think, oh, I might lose a friend, we should stop embracing the values and, and ideals of this world over the values of God. We should stop relying on money and family and our looks to make it 
in life. And instead, we should be including God in all of our plans. Don't get me wrong. Esther is a hero of the Bible. But it's not because of how her story begins. It's because of how her story ends. That despite her compromise, God does not give up on her. God uses her. He pursued her. He saved her. He changed her. And he used her to deliver his people. That's the story of the Bible, told again and again. So don't be shocked that Esther was human and that she had frailties and brokenness, just like you and me. Right now, she is in a horrible situation. And she was a hero who saved her people. But Jesus is the hero who saves the world. Like Esther, Jesus grew up far from home in a world of temptation. And like Esther, Jesus was offered a kingdom if only he would compromise. Matthew 4 says the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus is our perfect hero. Jesus demonstrated for us what it looks like to put God first in all things. And even when tempted by the devil, with all the riches of the world, he didn't compromise. But he's the only one who never compromised. And that's why he's our king. We have a better king than Xerxes. Aren't you glad you don't have to marry King Xerxes? (laughs) But the Bible does tell us about another king who does come and offer you his hand in marriage. But this king is different. Isaiah 54 says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. You know, God doesn't send a servant to go and find the brightest to belong to him. And he doesn't line all of us up from greatest to least and only choose the top 1%. Instead, our king came down off his throne to be with us. And he wasn't looking for beauty or perfection. In fact, Jesus once even said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Our king came to save outsiders. Our king came to rescue sinners. And he came for the broken. And he came for the needy. And we don't need to impress our king. And we don't need to dress up before we enter his presence. And our king doesn't wait a year for us to clean ourselves up. The Bible says in Romans, for while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God takes sinners and compromisers and failures and he loves them and he rescues them. And then bit by bit, He changes them and he uses them for his glory. That's the story of the Bible. That is the story of Esther. Our king calls you to be his bride. And he gave his life for you. But not because you are perfect. And not because you are beautiful. Your king died to make you beautiful. This Lent season, we are heading towards the cross, and I would invite you and your family to be a part of all of it. Join us as we go through the 40 days of Lent, as we get to the road that takes us to Palm Sunday, as we walk the steps of Calvary to Good Friday, and as we approach the empty tomb on Easter. It's a journey for each Christian to walk through this story together, and we invite you to Find any local church available to you where you can plug in and be a part of that story. Easter will be all the more sweeter 
the tomb more glorious if you take this journey with us. Join us each Sunday as we explore Esther and how it relates to us as we navigate living in the world, a world that often doesn't reflect our faith, how we live in that struggle, and then how we rejoice that the tomb is empty. Let's pray together. Lord, it's at this time that we begin the road to Easter, and we look forward to that Sunday with friends, with family, with community members, singing songs in praise of an empty tomb. We pray for each church all across the world, their pastors and their staff, as they make preparations for Easter. We pray that no matter how big or how small, every church seeks only to glorify you, to preach the gospel, to save lives, and to show people that they are right now beautiful and loved and accepted by you. Not because they're perfect or because of anything that they've done, and yet they are saved by grace. May the good news of your gospel and the good news of Easter be loudly proclaimed this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're here every Sunday, 9.30. Our services are traditional. We have a choir. We're going to sing all your favorite hymns. We're going to say the doxology. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We have communion. We even have responsive readings. At 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We're going to sing praise hymns. We have a worship band, and it's also the same hour. We have children's programs all the way up through high school. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Have a blessed Easter.